Uh, it has been almost a year and a half uh, since the Hanoi summit uh, in February of last year, uh, when Mr. Trump and Kim Jong-un uh, failed to produce any agreement. Uh, since then, uh, as you know, there has been uh, no progress uh, in the diplomatic efforts to denuclearize uh, North Korea. Uh, Steve Began, a uh, special rep on uh, North Korea, actually he gave a speech uh, early last year. So he was in Seoul earlier this week to discuss uh, North Korean issues with the South, South Korean government. But a few days ago, uh, Trump implied that he may hold a another summit meeting with Kim Jong-un, but uh, many experts, uh, including I think North Koreans themselves, are skeptical that there will be any major breakthrough uh, before the November elections. So meanwhile, our hopes for inter-Korean collaboration uh, have uh, diminished uh, as well. Okay, North Korea continues to criticize the South Korean government and last month even destroyed the Liaison office in Kaesong, which was a symbol of uh, renewed inter-Korean uh, collaboration. Okay, Seoul is eager to restart the inter-Korean dialogue, but it's not clear if Pyongyang is willing to do that anytime soon. Also, China has been you know, very active uh, in reaching out to Asian neighbors, uh, including North Korea, but US has been uh, retreating uh, from the region, uh, which creates concerns about US leadership uh, in, 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 in Asia. Uh, many in Seoul and Washington are worried about the future of the US-Korea alliance. So today we are going to discuss uh, where we stand now after a couple of years of uh, summit diplomacy with EPRK and what we can do uh, moving forward. I'm very happy to uh, introduce excellent lineup uh, for today's uh, panel and I'm going to introduce one by one. But I think let me briefly explain uh, today's format first. So instead of having each panelist make their remarks, but we will do a moderate uh, discussion for about uh, 40 minutes or so, followed by questions uh, from the audience. So as usual with webinars, uh, please send your question to the Q&A chat uh, window. Okay, here are our panelists. Uh, first, uh, Bob Carlin, uh, who is a visiting scholar at FSI Center for International Security and Cooperation. So he's been following uh, North Korea uh, since 1974. It's a long time. And he has made about 25 trips to uh, North Korea. I cannot think of any better expert on North Korea than uh, Bob Carlin. I'm very happy to uh, have you today. The second, uh, Professor uh, Victor Cha, uh, who's teaching at uh, you know, Georgetown. He also a uh, career chair and senior advisor uh, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. Among others, uh, you know, Victor Cha served at National Security Council uh, from 2004 to 2007, uh, where he was uh, director for Asian uh, Affairs. Okay, third, uh, Professor uh, Sig Hecker, uh, who's a professor emeritus uh, in the Department of Management Science and Engineering, and also a senior fellow uh, at FSI. So he's a renowned uh, expert on nuclear uh, issues. Uh, he was a uh, director of the Los Alamos National Lab. And then he made you know, many visits to uh, nuclear sites uh, in North Korea, including Yangbyon. Okay, last but not least, uh, Oriana Mestro was now teaching at uh, Georgetown uh, University. And she's also served as an officer uh, in the U.S. Air Force Reserve, uh, currently as a senior China analyst uh, at the Pentagon. 
I'm very happy to say that she will join us uh, from next month. So she'll be moving uh, from DC to uh, Stanford uh, next month. Okay, so uh, without any further ado, uh, let me start with a uh, very general but uh, also important you know, question is, uh, what's really going on uh, inside North Korea? Uh, it seems that North Korea has been you know, facing uh, serious economic difficulties uh, due to the ongoing international sanctions. And it looks like it got uh, much worse uh, since they shut off the border with China uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So as you know, more than 90% of North Korean total trade was with China. And the border closing must have created extra difficulties for North Korean uh, economy. Also, Kim Yo Jong, uh, Kim Jong Un's sister, has been uh, more active, uh, you know, in the regime, especially uh, making harsh measures against the South Korea. And I think just yesterday she said that uh, it's almost useless to meet uh, or to have a summit again with uh, United States. So earlier this year, there were speculations about Kim Jong-un's you know, health. So it looks like a lot of things happening uh, inside North Korea. So we like to uh, understand uh, what's really going on uh, for last six months in North Korea. So maybe should we start with Bob? Okay. Thank you, Giwak. Uh, I hate to kick off because I know Victor will be listening carefully and uh, I hope we can have a good conversation. I'm skeptical that the North Koreans are really in a bad spot. Everything in, in life is relative, obviously. And uh, US is in a bad spot. China's in a bad spot. Lots of countries are in an extremely bad situation. So North Korea is one of the group. They've been through really difficult times uh, throughout their existence. This is not a place they wanna be, but I don't, I don't think this is having policy implications. That's really the, the central question. Is the economic or health or international situation such that it is changing their policy calculations. And I don't get that feeling. If we had more people actually in on the ground reporting out, maybe we'd have a better sense. Maybe I'd change my views on that. But right now I don't see uh, the, re I don't see the reporting from North Korea suggesting that this situation is, is causing a rethink. Uh, you know, that, that remains for more information to feed into. Uh, the sister's role, you know, we, we saw Kim Jong-il's sister also playing a role. He was close to her. He made her a department director. This is a little bit different, obviously. She's much more, uh, she has a much higher profile than Kim Jong-il's sister, but the concept of bringing the sister in uh, to interact and to um, have a role in the decision making isn't all that different. Now, we don't know anything about the sister really. We have South Koreans met her, the Americans never have met her. We have lots of reporting on her, but uh, we don't have any real good face to face personal sense of who she is. She has a charming style. Uh, in some of the things that she releases, she has an incredibly tough style in some of the other things. So I don't know where that, that takes us. And uh, maybe there are other people on the panel who have a, a better sense. I, I'm just keeping an open mind on uh, what she's like and what influence she may have on the policy. As far as his health goes, uh, every single one of the previous leaders had health problems. Uh, 
Kim Jong-il probably had had heart problems. So it's, again, it's not a surprise. Mm -hmm. The question is what impact does it have internally? And uh, so far I haven't seen anything. Maybe it's beneath the surface, maybe we need more information, but right now it's not apparent that it's influence the, influencing the policy. How about Victor? Uh, do you have any thoughts? Sure. Or Oriana uh, or Sik? Yeah. Sure. Well, first, you and Catherine, thanks for having me. It's a really a pleasure to be uh, to be w here with you um, today. Um, <clears throat> the um, um, so for let me just make four quick points, and they kind of they um, they play off of what uh, Bob has already mentioned. The first on uh, Kim Jong Un's health. I mean, I agree. We just don't know. I mean, I thought it was unusual for him to miss the uh, April 15th, the birthday, the, the day of the sun, uh, which is a you know, pretty important event in, in North Korea. Um, and then he has appeared sporadically uh, since then. But we, you know, we just don't know. Part of the reason is, as Bob said, we don't have a lot of on the ground reporting because of all the, the restrictions and the quarantines because of COVID. A lot of the European missions are leaving, like uh, the British, um, basically closed their mission and left because they were not able to bring people in because of the COVID restrictions. Um, second, on Yo Jong's role, Kim Yo Jong's role, the sister, um, it's definitely increasing. I would agree with Bob. For what purpose, we don't exactly know. Um, she has been associated with the inter-Korean part of diplomacy, both when she uh, visited uh, South Korea during the uh, Pyeongchang Olympics in the winter of 2018, which started the whole diplomatic ball rolling. <clears throat> and then also in her recent tough statements on South Korea and, and associating herself with the, with the uh, blowing up of the, whatever the $150 million inter-Korean cooperation building that the South Koreans built on the, on the Northern side of the border. Um, so her role definitely is increasing and I would agree for what purpose is not clear. Um, and then the, the last point I want to make is, is I agree with Bob that we don't know how much this is affecting the economy, but it, it's, it is definitely a fact that the North Korean economy is in pretty bad shape right now. According to uh, Fitch and some of the other um, economic analysts, the, the economy is contracting by 6% this year, which is the worst contraction since 1997. Um, I think the permissive condition for this are the cumulative effect of sanctions over, over five years, um, which has affected all external trade, but in particular trade with South Korea, which is down to about $3 million now to a trade as opposed to $3 billion only five years ago, including humanitarian assistance. And then the specific cause is of course COVID and the quarantine, particularly the closing of border and trade with China um, which has actually taken down Chinese trade with North Korea by 90% year on year. So um, what, now whether that's affecting policy, we can discuss, debate that, but uh, I think it's important to note that the economy is in quite bad shape. And yes, North Koreans are used to tightening their belts. Uh, but again, this is, this is some of the worst contraction we've seen um, since the mid 1990s. So I think, you know, we know that, uh, you know, North Korea went through uh, very difficult uh, economic situation in 1990s. And, you know, some people are saying that now, you know, they have, uh, you know, different generation. I mean, sure, you know, those guys are still poor, but then uh, the current generation is different than uh, previous one 30 years ago. So, I mean, does he have any implication uh, for Kim Jong-un's uh, regime, especially if they are facing uh, economic challenge? Yeah, so I think that I think that that's right, and um, yes, it probably makes them less tolerant. They're they're of of uh, the sort of economic contraction and the potential hardship that we're, that we're that we may see in the country. Um, um, even though this is, as many on this call know, even though this is a family-run business, I mean, performance is still important. You have to be able to deliver deliver the goods, uh, whether it's a dictatorship or not. So. Um, so I think there is that that element, um, and and we like we don't know yet uh, how much the economic situation has manifested itself in terms of the lives of the elite in North Korea. I mean, because those are the people that matter the most, the people who live in 
in, in Pyongyang. And, and we don't have a, a, a good sense of that, but it's hard for me to imagine that a 6% contraction is not going to impact uh, the mm -hmm. lives of uh, the elite in North Korea, especially if the border with China continues to be closed and, and uh, trade has diminished to really a fraction of what it's been in the past. Okay, so let's then take a look at uh, uh, different sides, uh, especially uh, nuclear and uh, missile capabilities. I think there are indication that uh, North Korea has continued to you know, improve uh, their military uh, capability. And we know that uh, they haven't done any testing, uh, either nuclear or ICBM, uh, since they engage in the summit diplomacy. But they have done some uh, you know, short and middle, middle range uh, missile testing. So, I mean, do you have any updates about their current capability? Uh, I mean, this might be one area that uh, North Korea has been in a good position, uh, SIG or Oriana. Sure, uh, thanks for that question, Hiwak, and uh, I'm happy to be a part of this discussion. I focus much more on the China aspect and then the military aspect, so, so hopefully I can shed some light on the status of their program. I mean, the one thing, as you mentioned, is they did start up testing again in March, but of short range, missile systems. And this is a very important distinction from the part of the United States, because from a U.S. perspective, I think why this administration got so strict with North Korea, and I think credibly threatened to use force on the Korean Peninsula as a result, is that Kim Jong-un was moving along and successfully testing an ICBM, which meant he could deliver a nuclear warhead to the United States. Now, he hasn't continued that testing. So in that respect, we are in a better position you know, than we were a year ago. And the other thing that he would need to test is that right now all their previous ICBMs and their longer range missiles were liquid fueled. Um, and what this means is liquid is corrosive. And so if you were gonna shoot a missile, you have to fill it up with liquid first. You can't keep the liquid in there. Um, and so it, it causes delays. And the idea is the United States, given our intelligence capabilities, we would be able to see them preparing an ICM that's liquid fueled. So one of the things that you know, I'm keeping an eye out for is not only if they test an ICBM, but if they engage in other testing that suggests that they're having an easier time with solid fueled versus liquid fueled systems. And right now they haven't been engaging in that testing. Um, and so I think even though we, we have seen more hostility towards ROK, we don't see negotiations between North Korea and the United States starting up anytime soon, we do see an uh, increase in testing of short range systems uh, that we are actually, well, it could be worse, I guess, is, is what I want to mm -hmm. say. We're actually in a relatively uh, positive position from a military operational standpoint. So, Sik, uh, do you agree? Well, thank you. Uh, let me also say it's a great pleasure uh, to be here uh, with you and, and with the panel. Uh, so, actually, going back to your previous question as to what's been happening in the last 18 months, uh, one thing I can tell you for sure is, is uh, they have not uh, put their nuclear scientists and engineers on, on vacation and sent them home. <laughs> so, uh, there, there are a couple of things they haven't done, and Oriana just mentioned, very importantly, uh, no more ICBM tests. I happen to think that's very important. Uh, I'm one who believes that they do not have the current capability uh, with a nuclear-tipped ICBM to reach the United States. To do so, uh, they need more ICBM testing and they need more nuclear testing. They have also done no more nuclear tests. However, what's happened in the 18 months uh, is they're able to produce more highly enriched uranium. Uh, and even though nobody knows for sure, you know, uh, Bob and I saw that facility uh, in 2010, and I later um, sort of made the best estimate possible of perhaps they can make about 150 kilograms of highly enriched uranium per year, which would be more or less, let's just say, six bombs worth. And uh, I believe they've continued to produce that. You know, so in the last year and a half, uh, they've produced, uh, let's say, eight or nine bombs worth of highly enriched uranium. Uh, however, what they have not done is they have produced uh, no more plutonium and they've produced no tritium. The tritium is the stuff that you need for the hydrogen bombs. Uh, and, and that's very, very peculiar uh, in that 
It's a little reactor that's been operating on and off since 1986. I uh, went down in uh, late 2018 and they have not restarted it. Uh, and the experimental light water reactor that they've been building, Bob and I saw that also in 2010, uh, that is still not operational, even though it's externally complete. But with no reactors, you get no plutonium, you get no tritium because you have to make the tritium in the reactor. And so so that's good news. They are not doing that for political reasons, in my opinion. Uh, so they're having technical difficulties. Doesn't mean they couldn't, at one point, they're going to get them back on, but they've made no more. Does it make a difference? The answer is yes. So for example, the September 3rd, 2017 test, uh, which was 200, 250 kilotons or so, was most likely a hydrogen bomb. For that hydrogen bomb, you need tritium. Uh, you also need plutonium, uh, and they've not made more. And so from that standpoint, that part of it has slowed down. The HEU, the highly enriched uranium, they keep pumping out. Uh, but to me, that's nowhere near uh, as much of a concern. I'm a little more concerned than what Oriana indicated on the solid rocket fuel, uh, because that does make it more possible for them uh, to then quickly, with solid rocket motors, to reach South Korea and Japan. And I do believe they've done enough nuclear tests, six altogether now, uh, that they're able to put a missile uh, on those short and medium range missiles. And that certainly makes the situation uh, very dangerous. So bottom line is they continue to pile up nuclear stuff. They're certainly working on miniaturizing uh, for ICBMs. They're certainly looking uh, at how to do the next generation of ICBM. Uh, but at least there are a couple of things they haven't done. No nuclear test, no long-range missile test. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let's uh, now uh, you know, go to you know, Washington. I cannot resist uh, asking a uh, question about uh, John Bolton's book, uh, The Room Where It Happened. So you know, it got a lot of attention uh, here and also uh, in Korea. Uh, it's very unusual uh, for former advisor to criticize the president in, uh, in office, and basically saying that uh, the US DPRK summit uh, was a show, which is not too surprising. But then uh, I think the one question is, uh, you know, how much uh, can you trust of this argument? And you know, what, what to make out of you know, you know, those uh, you know, statements uh, in his book, uh, especially, are you going to expect any October surprise? I mean, like uh, Trump uh, and Pompeo kind of implied, and South Korean president saying that they are working to make that happen, but Kim Yo Jong saying it's useless. So, any comments on the book and this possibility of uh, October surprise, Bob or Victor? You want to go first, Bob, or? Victor, go, uh, you go on. You've been in the NST, so you go ahead. Um, so, uh, yes, it's a very interesting book. Uh, uh, I read it over the long weekend, the July 4th weekend. Um, you know, his views on the North Korea situation are, are well known. Um, um, I certainly saw it and experienced it during my time when I was um, on the NSC and when I was um, a part of the negotiating team at Six Party Talks in Beijing and Bolton was either the undersecretary or the UN ambassador. Um, so I've certainly seen uh, his views up, uh, uh, up front and very close. Uh, we also saw it when he gave a speech at CSIS right after he left the, uh, the Trump White House. Um, and so his views were not surprising to me at all. I mean, there, I guess there, there are a few things that I think are important. And, and, and put, Regardless of the question of whether he's exaggerated or not, I think there are a few things that we can pull out of that that I think are important for our listeners, especially those who may not have read the book. The first is, as you mentioned in your question, suggested in your question, how you know it's it's astounding how willfully unprepared Trump was for these summits. I mean, looking at it from a perspective, from a Korean perspective, you could argue that this is these are some of the most important meetings um, that could determine the fate of what, he, what happens on the Korean Peninsula. And all Trump cared about was what the media would say and how he would look 
um, and whether it would be a bigger story if he walked away from Hanoi as opposed to doing a small deal. Um, and so, you know, so that's, that's one point. And, and I don't think that that's an exaggeration, at least from many others who've, who worked in this administration. The second is um, the, uh, the, deco the, the decoupling from alliances is completely unproblematic for Trump. Um, so decoupling is when an ally separates their own security interests from that of uh, another ally vis-a-vis -vis the adversary. Um, the one example of this was clearly on missiles. Um, uh, Trump was told, you know, at least a hundred times by people like Shinzo Abe and by Bolton that the, the full portfolio of North Korea's missile threats would, would have to be deal, dealt with. Um, and Trump just turns around and asks Kim to stop the ICBM test, which is, you know, classic delinking. Um, and, you know, you know, why is that important? Well, it's important because when the patron ally delinks, it reduces confidence in the United States overall, the U.S. defense commitment overall, and that can have all, can have all sorts of repercussions in terms of the way allies behave going forward. Third, um, um, I think one of the most important things that, to me that came out of the book, um, which, um, which was something that I had that I had believed already was that, I mean, the chance of war on the Korean Peninsula was very real at one point. Um, Bolton even says in the book, he, Trump and Kelly put it at 50-50 at the end of 2017. Uh, Bolton argues about as clearly as I've ever heard him argue anywhere um, for a preemptive strike against North Korea with conventional bombing uh, of artillery. Um, and so that, you know, that too was, I think, a very dangerous period. Um, not just because that the United States might carry out an attack, but because of the danger of miscalculation. Um, as we've learned from other books like the Woodward book um, and what Trump wanted to do on, on North Korea. Um, and then the final point, I, at least I, initially I'd like to make is that the only party that from Trump's book, uh, from Bolton's book, the only party that seemed to care about a peace regime on the Korean Peninsula appeared to be the South Koreans uh, in the sense that South Korea uh, and Moon was pushing very hard for this to be on the agenda of both Kim and Trump uh, before Singapore and Hanoi. Um, uh, but that in fact, when the two met, uh, they realized it wasn't as important to them, to the, to the uh, counterpart as they thought. And in that sense, it kind of fell by the wayside, which is, which is, uh, which is unfortunate. So, I mean, there's more I could say, but let me leave it at that for now. You all, can I just, can sure. I just jump in on something yeah, that Victor yes. said? Um, two quick points, not maybe an alternative, not to disagree, but sort of an alternative perspective on, on two points he made. The first one was about the ICBM and delinking with allies. And I agree that may, that's what the Trump administration did. But theoretically, I argued at the time that that was more of a problem of messaging. Because in reality, I think the United States um, credibility to defend South Korea and Japan is higher if we don't risk absorbing a nuclear attack from North Korea, right? So if North Korea can't touch the United States, I think the likelihood, you know, that we would fight to protect South Korea and Japan actually is higher than if it looks like North Korea could deliver a nuclear weapon to the United States. So in my mind, that doesn't necessarily have to lead to what Victor was saying, which was that sort of decoupling. But I agree with Victor that there was sort of a fumbling of the issue. So maybe the end result was that that was the perspective of the allies uh, and partners. But in reality, I think if we had dealt with it correctly, it could have led to an increased credibility of, of the U.S. commitment. And the second thing about the dangerous period he mentioned, I, you know, I completely agree. I was actually, while of course I'm here speaking in my civilian capacity and my views are my own and don't represent those of the United States Air Force uh, or the Department of Defense. I was on military duty during that period and also deployed to Korea during that period. Mm. And, you know, and for me, that the, it was very real. I mean, we were, you know, getting ready to go. Um, and while that was very scary and a lot of people might have disagreed with that policy, it did create a sense of urgency for the first time in Beijing. For the first time in Beijing, China thought, if we don't do something, the United States might start a conventional war against North Korea. And so we did have this opening, actually, that I think Trump squandered by not actually then taking advantage of the fact that the Chinese were for the first time really willing um, to try to push North Korea towards some sort of deal. The North Koreans also, I think, you know, and I'm not a North Korea expert, but it seemed that 
you know, the threat of this U.S. attack was so credible that they too at least wanted to, to change the status quo to a certain degree. So it's really unfortunate that President Trump only cared about how it looked because I think we did have an opportunity there that we didn't take advantage of. Well, Bob or Sick, uh, you want to add anything? Sick, can, uh, let me jump in just uh, briefly, okay? I think um, I put a different uh, perspective on uh, several of those points, although I recognize um, you can make the arguments both that Oriana and, and Victor made, and they're very strong, but there's another perspective as well. First of all, uh, although we in the United States were, were definitely worried in 2017 and saw things getting better, my argument is that as of July 2017, Kim Jong-un was already planning to pivot away. Uh, he knew he needed to do a few more things in his mind to get the attention of the Americans and to be in a place where he thought he could conduct diplomacy. And so his job was to keep the Americans a little bit off balance, um, but he wasn't planning on anything nutty. And by December, he had already made it really clear that he was, he was off of this um, particular uh, uh, policy route and was going to move over. As far as the um, summits go and the book goes, John Bolton makes it per perfectly clear, the same way he did in uh, 2001 about the agreed framework. He makes it perfectly clear he did not want the summits to succeed or to make progress. I mean, how would you define success? He did not want them to happen and he did not want anything to come out of them. And if something came out of them, he was bound and determined to make sure they didn't get traction. And he succeeded. He succeeded just like he did in 2001. And that's one of the reasons we're in the position we are today. He raised Libya knowing full well the toxic nature fumes that would be let off from that example. And he, he's, he likes to argue in the book, oh, no, no, I didn't mean uh, the entire Libyan experience with uh, Gaddafi ending up dead. I was only talking about something um, very narrow, this, the withdrawal of nuclear um, materials from Libya. That's baloney. That's total baloney, and he knows it. Um, he wanted a... Um, six to nine month timeline for totally denuclearizing North Korea. That's ridiculous. And the president understood that, I think. I, we got to give the credit to the, pre a little bit more credit to the president. He could under, I think he saw that Trump's approach was simply not going to work in this case. Uh, and then in the summer after Singapore, this last point, in the summer of uh, 2018 in July, when we had had a relatively um, successful summit in Singapore, it wasn't a zing zing ring the bell success, but it was enough to get things started. He helped Pompeo when he went in July to Pyongyang pour cold water over the whole thing. And that's why the North Koreans were so furious. Trump, I mean, uh, Pompeo said to uh, Kim, oh, incidentally, what we want is a complete accounting of your nuclear uh, holdings. That was, that was foolish. It was counterproductive. And it was a sure way to make sure that we got off track, which is exactly what happened. So. Bolton's pernicious influence, much as I enjoy the book and I enjoy his writing, but his pernicious influence is still hanging over us mm -hmm. today, I, I think. Mm -hmm. Sick. So, Kiwok, yeah, let me weigh uh, in also. Uh, I've, uh, I've read the North Korea chapters and, and a bit uh, of the Russian chapters. Uh, and so, uh, even though people call this the, the tell-all book, you know, of Bolton, uh, on Trump. Uh, I would put it very differently. This is the tell-all book on Bolton, on Bolton, Bolton speaking about Bolton. 
You know, there's essentially, even though uh, everything that Victor uh, said is, is true, it's just remarkable that a U.S. president would be so ill-prepared and all that. Essentially, nothing uh, that Bolton said about Trump related to North Korea surprised me. I ex if I didn't know it already, I expected that Trump would do any of those. But Bolton surprised me even about Bolton, even though I had no suspicions going back to 2001 you know, one and 2002. Uh, it's just, it's amazing. I mean, he, he lays out the whole game plan of how he, Bolton, he knew what was right in the world. And it doesn't matter whether it's North Korea, whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's Iran. Bolton knows what's right in the world. He looks through the Bolton lenses. And then what he did was he took advantage of a dysfunctional White House and what he calls an ignorant president in order to further his own agenda. And, and particularly what I found so interesting in the Singapore summit, he didn't have all that much uh, to do. He tried to work on the edges, but in Hanoi, he was there much more than what I had been led to believe uh, in order to scuttle the Hanoi uh, summit. And one of the most interesting parts of his book then is not so much as to whether Bolton told the truth or not, but did he actually tell everything? And in Hanoi, he definitely did not. And I think that's outrageous. He never covered the part where the North Korean delegation went back out, talked to Kim Jong-un, came back in, and told Began, Young Byun means everything. It means the whole thing. Bolton never covered that because he didn't want to get to the point where it actually looked like the North Koreans offered up something that might have been attractive because his view was the Libya model, you know, not Gaddafi, you know, uh, getting, uh, getting killed, but the Libya model that North Korea had to renounce and get rid of everything before you take any action. So uh, I found the book just incredibly informative uh, and also very disturbing until, uh, because of what Bolton tells us about Bolton. So I guess uh, it's a worth paying for the book, huh? <laughs> yeah, Victor, yeah. Yeah, so can I just pick up on that? So I, sure. I, I mean, I think one of the ironies of the Hanoi chapter, what it was called, checking into the Hanoi Hilton and checking out, I think that was the title of the chapter. What, one of the, I think one of the ironies of that is that as he tells his story, and as Sig's right, he does leave out significant parts. I was looking for that part too like uh, the, the North Korean response. All he kept saying was that the North Koreans didn't have a plan B. Um, and, um, but what I thought was interesting was, you know, there's a point in the, so my point is the irony of the book, of that chapter is that as he shows the Hanoi summit meltdown and the role he played in its meltdown, he also explained um, what Giuk mentioned, which is the path to an October, so-called October surprise, right? Because, um, Bolton gets to the point where he thinks he's convinced Trump that walking away is better, right? And appeals to like Trump's basis instincts. It's better to dump, you know, dump your partner than be dumped by them, all this sort of stuff. And he feels like he's got Trump where he wants. And then Trump, who is, you know, innately inclined to look for some sort of deal at one point actually says, well, what if we relieved a percentage of the sanctions, right? Um, in, re in return for a, a young Bin or young William plus or whatever it might be. And I don't know if you remember in the book, he, Bolton writes, this was like, this was the moment where his, his like heart fell into his stomach, that this was the moment at which he thought there actually could be a deal, right? And, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, as we go forward looking and I mean, I don't, I can't read the tea leaves of what North Korea is saying right now, their rejection of, October surprise or all these sorts of things. Um, but um, um, it's not inconceivable that, uh, that Trump, as we get close to November, is looking for another big distraction, um, another, another phase one deal that he, can, that he can tout as being great diplomacy on his part, saving the United States from the North Korean threat, you know, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> and, and it's not implausible that uh, on the North Korean side, they might be willing to take half a loaf rather than a whole loaf when it comes to sanctions relief, um, especially if um, their economic situation is as, as bad as people think it is. Um, so I thought that, to me, that was one of the interesting things I got out of, the, out of that particular chapter was as much as he was, Bolton was explaining 
you know, in, in very clinical terms, how he could, he helped to melt down the Hanoi summit. He was also showing the path out um, towards a deal. Okay, so let's now, uh, you know, go to, you know, Seoul and also has implication for Washington and Pyongyang. And this is also you know, a question from the audience. So regarding uh, Moon Jae-in's you know, policy uh, to North Korea, maybe next uh, six to 12 months, uh, we know that uh, you know, recently they reshuffled uh, national security team. So among other you know, people, uh, they appointed uh, Park Ji Won, you know, who was a key advisor to uh, Kim Dae Jung, and who was involved in the first uh, Inter-Korea summit. Now he became uh, the chief of uh, National Intelligence Service. They also appointed or, or nominated uh, Lee In Young uh, to Unification Minister, and you know, he was a you know leading you know, activist uh, in 1980s who led uh, you know anti-American. Uh, democratic movement. And I'm sure you know, many of you have been to Seoul and hear this story. And you know, I hear you know, privately and publicly you know, you know, you know, some you know, South Korean uh, senior officials saying that, you know, look, you know, we really wanted to do something with North Korea, but every time we wanted to do something, the United States say no. Okay, so I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I hear those kind of complaints, uh, you know, privately and publicly, you know, from Seoul. So I wouldn't be too surprised if, uh, you know, South Korean, Korean government, you know, may do something, okay, even with objection uh, from Washington, because they realize that now, time, you know, time is running out. So if they don't do anything, you know, sometime maybe like this year or early next year, you know, they may be out of power again. So, so one question is, uh, do you think uh, South Korea will do something uh, to restart uh, inter-Korean dialogue, even with objection from the United States? If so, how North Korea will react? Will they accept uh, such approach? And what will be the reaction you know, by Washington? Is it really going to hurt? the alliance between U.S. and ROK? I know it's a very you know, tough question and uh, a little touchy question, but then I welcome your comments on this. Uh, I'll, yeah, sure. All right, so first in terms of the new team, right, that they put into place, um, if you were going to put together a so-called dream team, for engagement with North Korea, this would be it. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, as you said, you know, Park Ji Won is NIS, uh, Yi In Young is Unification Minister, and So Hun, right, as yeah. uh, in the Blue House. Um, that is, if you ever wanted an engagement oriented team in the Blue House and in, in the cabinet, that is the team, right? That is. So I think it, it, it does pretty clearly state what their intentions are for the remainder of his time in office. Now, whether they'll actually go forward, I mean, this goes back to the earlier discussion we were having about linking and delinking because, so to go back to what Oriana said, yes, uh, if, if we can stop an ICBM threat, that may make us more credible vis-a-vis -vis protecting South Korea. But in, if it's happening in the context of where the United States is also saying, do as many SRBM tests as you want, we really don't care. Um, plus, I'm thinking of pulling troops out of Korea uh, because I hate having troops in Korea, I don't think they should be there, then that becomes a very different dynamic. And so my point here is the willingness of a South Korean government, any South Korean government, but even this South Korean government, a progressive one, to be willing to go forward without, US con without ignoring U.S. constraints or restraints is partly a function of how much credibility they put in the alliance. And I think, you know, Washington, Trump has done nothing, zero, to enhance the credibility alliance mm -hmm. and is almost giving license to the South Koreans to go off mm -hmm. on their own and be self-help oriented. Because if your patron ally is self-help oriented, why shouldn't you be self-help oriented? Mm -hmm. Now, whether the North Koreans will react positively to that, you know, they may, I think in some measure, but in the end, you know, they want to deal with the United States, right? In the end, that, that's who they want to deal with. So there might be some um, initial positive reception uh, to it. But, um, but I think there'll be limits to what they can do because you know, the prime target is the United States. 
Bob or Oriana or Sik? I worry that there might be a personality problem. That is to say, I'm not sure Kim Jong Un has a good impression of President Moon. He thinks he he led him down the wrong path, and so there's a sort of a residual resentment there. They can overcome that. That's not that, that doesn't always define the policy, but it's not a helpful thing. I do think that the North Koreans understand that every single South Korean president, going back to uh, Chun doo even, at the end of their term, wants to make a, wants to make big progress on inter-Korean relations. It's just part of their genetic makeup. And so they have a calendar and they're looking at how much longer Moon has and they know he's gonna get more and more desperate in their view, to move. And so they're gonna wait until they think he's really, really at the edge of the leash there. Now, it, that may not come in this admi presidential administration. They can, they can wait until next year to, uh, to move on this. And then they'll gauge it on who the president is. And if it's Biden, they may have a completely different set of um, circumstances different from what Victor was laying out, which gives them potentially a little bit more running room, in their view, uh, to use progress with the South uh, to help them with the Americans. So it's a question of timing and what the results of the election are, it seems to me. It's not simply, uh, will they respond to the South Koreans? There's so many other pieces of this mix that they're gonna mm -hmm. take into account. Mm -hmm. So, Sig or Oriana, any comments on this? Can I just say, I think that's, yeah. you, I think, so the last thing that Bob said is interesting. I mean that um, the North Koreans will use inter-Korean engagement to put pressure on a Biden administration um, to engage because a Biden administration presumably would care about alliance coordination and staying close with our allies. Um, but um, might not respond in a Trump because Trump doesn't care about it. It, it would not put it would not put pressure on Trump. Having said that, I think if they had the choice, they would prefer to have Trump for another four years than Biden. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, if if not because they think he's an easy mark for a deal because he doesn't care about substance and he just wants the big show. If not for that reason, for the reason of the effects that the deteriorating effects that a four, another four years of Trump would have on the alliance with South Korea, because I have no, you know, I have no idea what the alliance with South Korea will look like four years from now if Trump still is president, but it will be worse than it is today. That I think we can be pretty pretty certain of, and even questioning whether they'd still be troops on the peninsula at a, at the end of a second Trump term, and and that would be something that the North Koreans would take also. Um, um, as a benefit that they might not get under Biden. Okay, so this is a question uh, from the audience. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Steve Began was in Seoul uh, in earlier this week. And I think he said something like, you know, I don't take uh, my direction from you know, Choi Sun Hee of North Korea or from John Burton, right? And he said that both are locked in an old way of thinking and we need to be more uh, you know, creative or thinking creatively. So do you have any sense of what he meant uh, saying that they are locked in all the way, old fashioned way, or we need to think more creatively? So any, any light on that? Uh, Giwok, well, I don't have any insight on what he meant, um, I might offer I agree with the position we need to think more creatively and there's sort of one thing that I think we need to consider that no one is really willing to consider. Um, and that is while, and Victor mentioned this, while the North Korea threat still exists, I firmly believe that US troops should remain in South Korea and moreover that they should continue to exercise because it really does impact, you know, operational readiness to do so. However, when you look at what the Chinese are considering when it looks at this whole North Korea issue, the big thing from China's point of view is the geopolitical uh, competition with the United States. 
Xi Jinping has said himself that the goal or the end objective is a reunified Korea under South Korean control. The issue from the Chinese perspective is they don't want to stick their necks out if a South Korea is going to still be leaning very heavily towards the United States to increase U.S. influence on the peninsula. And so I firmly believe, and, and we can argue whether this is a good idea or a bad idea, but if, if China believed that if North Korea no longer existed and we had a reunified peninsula, that then at that point, the U.S. military would go home. Maybe not abrogate the treaty. Maybe it would be like a mm -hmm. Philippines type of situation, which we still have a treaty, but our troops aren't there. I think China would be uh, in a much stronger position, not even with economic sanctions, but also militarily to deal with North Korea. We know they have contingencies to do so. They have 120,000 troops on the border that, you know, train for a quick entry and also amphibious entry and airlift. Um, but this is something that the United States is unwilling to talk about with the Chinese. But I do think we should, you know, make the, the commitment, um, if we can get more Chinese support, to say, you know, after we've fulfilled our alliance commitments to South Korea, and if they're no longer under threat, then uh, U.S. military personnel would go home. Uh, yeah, Gibb, let, let me uh, yeah, also sure. add something related specifically uh, to the comments about Began. Uh, so Began came in, in in September of 2018, and as you well remember, in January of 2019, uh, he came uh, to Stanford uh, and he gave a talk sort of laying out uh, that it's time to take a new and different approach, sort of a step-by-step mm -hmm. -step approach. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if you've read the Bolton book, uh, you know that Began comes in for particularly scorn and great criticism uh, yeah. because showing any indication that he was willing to deal and work on a step-by-step -step approach to Bolton was absolute death. And so we had Began, who had the right sense of what it might take to get a deal with North Korea. Uh, and he was taking advantage, I think, of, of a president uh, who had a gut instinct of wanting to do something with North Korea. So Began tried to turn that into getting somewhere with North Korea. Uh, the way I would view it, he didn't have any help from, uh, from State, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and he had total, complete opposition uh, from uh, John Bolton. And again, what John Bolton uh, shows you in the book is that in Hanoi, he was there constantly behind the scenes. And so mm -hmm. now Began is there, you know, still hoping to do something. Uh, but, you know, right now, I just don't see how you can get there. But at least mm -hmm. uh, he says he still wants to talk. So that's my view. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, yeah, let me just start, yeah. So I think that, um, so I think that's inter the observation about Began is interesting. Um, some of us who've worked with Steve Began in previous administrations find this all very interesting because I would have never pegged Steve Began as, you know, pro engagement with North Korea, guy, <laughs> to say the least. But I mean, you know, he's do he's doing what he's asked to do. I, I mean, I, I I think I mean Sig may be right. He doesn't have a lot of help or a lot of top cover. I mean, I I think that Pompeo is like playing both sides of the street here because he's clearly quite skeptical in private conversation with Bolton, but then at the same time he's allowing Began to to sort of go for it even even to circumvent interagency process to table drop different uh, documents with the North Koreans. But, but I think like, so going for, you, you said about a new idea, begins new idea. You know, going forward, if, if this step-by-step -step approach is adopted, um, you know, we predictably get to a, a, a point at which um, there is the exchange of energy and fuel and, and other sorts of assistance for a freeze on the facilities. And this is where we always get stuck because then the next step is the declaration, verification, declaration and verification of the declaration. And I think if we're ever going to sort of get around that thing again, like get past that point, like I think it's not hard to get back to a step for step freeze for freeze. That's not hard to get to in the next administration. The real question is where you go from there. And I'm increasingly of the view that you know, declara verification declaration is not going to be the answer because we'll get stuck again. It's really the next step then becomes political. Like how do you politically transform the relationship between the United States and DPRK um, as, the, as the next, that's the next platform, the next place we have to get before we can start talking about verification declaration because that it's just not gonna happen. We're gonna end up in the same place again and it'll fall apart. Thank you. 
just uh, oh, yeah, sick, yeah. If I may, just a quick comment on, on Victor's comment, which which I think is right on, uh, and and the point that I want to make. So if we get back to a freeze or, or stopping whatever parts of the program, what's actually more important, at least from my view of the technical history uh, of North Korea's program, is what's actually more important than the freeze itself as to whether we have feet on the ground in places like Yongbyon, whether the Americans are in there, whether the IAEA is in there. And if you look back over the history, the North Koreans, in my opinion, over the last 30 years have never completely, completely given up, you know, the getting towards a nuclear weapons capability. However, when we have feet on the ground, it slows them down enormously. And, and that's the part that to me is most important. If I look at the technical things, the advancement that have made, that's what was the most important thing about Hanoi, in my opinion was Hanoi would have been feet back on the ground. We don't have any feet back on the ground. We don't know what's going on. Well, Bob? I would add that uh, a partial answer to the questions that, or the observations that uh, Victor made uh, can be found in, this, in Kim Yo Jung's statement yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, she lays out um, in in much clearer language, things that have been sort of hidden in North Korean statements up to now. And in one sentence, she says, uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da, it would be easier and more favorable for the US to rack its brains to make our nukes no threat to the US rather than racking its brains on how to dispossess us of our nukes. I mean, that's pretty blunt, right? That's what we've been afraid of all along, that we were gonna get back to the position of, of implicitly or explicitly accepting them as a nuclear uh, state. And what, what they're now saying uh, very bluntly to us is, if you want a good starting point, this is where you're gonna to have to start. You may wanna pull the nukes away from us over time, but you're going to have to start from the position that you accept that we have them. I don't know if any administration can do that, although I think more and more people are beginning to realize that somehow we may have to swallow something like that medicine if we're going to make any progress at all. Okay, now I think it's approaching uh, two o'clock, but uh, let me ask one more question, then uh, we can wrap up. Uh, you know, I'm sure uh, North Korea is watching uh, U.S. elections, you know, very closely. And I kind of agree with Victor that uh, they may prefer Trump <laughs> uh, to, to Biden. And then uh, if you look at uh, Kim Yong's letter, uh, he's saying that it's useless to have a summit. But I think he also, she also added that uh, our chairman uh, sends uh, regards to Trump. So, so if uh, North Korea, let's assume that if they want to have uh, Trump uh, reelected, what can or they should do to help or just don't do anything? That's my final question. Yeah. You look, I feel like even if I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't want to say it out loud, lest I help Trump, Trump get reelected. <laughs> um, so, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna keep silent on that one. Yeah. Victor? Um, so what can they do to help Trump, uh, to, to, to Trump get reelected? Well, I mean, you know, an October surprise, right? That might be one way to at least have, have Trump be able to and say, look, I've solved this problem too. You know, that might, not, not that his base really cares about that problem, but, but you know, that certainly, uh, that certainly might be one thing. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that they would be much more comfortable with, with Trump, not just because, you know, it, it could uh, mean the alliance would weaken and um, they could do more summits and, and focus on um, things that, uh, and, and really sort of be able to play him more but also because of the relationship with China. Um, I mean that, you know, 
that the relationship with China would be probably continue to be quite bad. And I think North Koreans are more comfortable when the U.S. and China are at each other's uh, each other's throats than when they are um, in some sort of great power condominium and cutting the kind of deal that Oriana was talking about. Bob, I think the North Koreans are in, intensely realistic. And uh, even if they would prefer Trump to get a second term, if they're being fed the information from their sources in the United States, they've got to see that the chances are getting less and less uh, good for him to be reelected. And they better start positioning themselves for the next administration, putting down some markers, um, uh, creating uh, sort of uh, policy options for themselves so that when that happens, when there's a new president, they don't have to do a complete throw everything away, but they can have sort of a continuity, which is what they love in their policy. I, I'd be surprised if they calculated that they thought they could do anything that would really benefit the president. Mm. The thick, uh, you have the final word? Yeah, just the, the, the uh, quick uh, final comment. Uh, Bolton's book, uh, you, you know, has clearly shown that from an international relations standpoint, uh, he doesn't want four more years of Trump. This country can't afford it. But that's not where the action is going to be in the election as far as I'm concerned. Mm. So I don't think there's anything North Korea can mm. do because the issue today is domestic. And it is Trump's response to the pandemic and Trump's response to the issue of systemic racism as such that I think they will finally catch up with him domestically. Okay, so I think time is up and thank you so much um, for fantastic and stimulating discussions and also to the audience, uh, thanks for joining us. So I think we'll come back to discuss North Korea again maybe uh, before the end of the year. So once again, thank you so much and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.